Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose the nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message.
Shalom Nashimitikot. Hello, sweet women. I'm so excited to be with you again. And I'm loving the different things the Lord's teaching us through 2 Corinthians, right? And um, oh, we need to continue praying for wisdom for the Israeli government, for peace and safety for the precious people and for comfort for those whose loved ones have been lost in this war, and also that the rest of the hostages, that God just does a miracle and they're saved. So I know God hears our prayers, and I pray more than anything that through this, many come to know their Lord and Savior. So let's keep it in prayer, and especially as the North's heating up, um, wisdom for the government and that God just intervenes. I know that he promises to make Israel, you know, it's his chosen people, it's his chosen land, so he will prevail. So let's just keep praying and get something warm to drink um, or cold, but Ani Lishto or Shota. Um, chalav ve kinemon. So I am drinking hot milk with cinnamon or steamed milk. It's tov meod. Very good. So get cozy in your chair and let's see what the Lord wants to teach us now. Remember, last week we talked about God giving us as believers the gift of His Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. I mean, the Bible talks about His Holy Spirit a lot. Remember, He's also our comforter with the Lord's comfort. And I'm so, so thankful that the Lord has left us with His Holy Spirit when we give our life to Him. And also we talked about last week the importance of faithfully sharing with others about Yeshua and everything that he did on the cross for us. Um, and we also talked about not becoming really close friends with those that don't know the Lord. You know, Paul describes it as light and dark. And I hope you were able to spend time with the Lord last week, asking him how to show you, or to show you, if one, there was anything that we're doing that's not pleasing to him. Lord, anything that I am doing that doesn't please you, show me please. And then the second thing we were going to ask him is, is there anyone that I'm close to that's slowly drawing me away from you? And that's an important one also. We need to be the light, right? And Aren't you so, so thankful that the Lord loves us enough to tell us to stay away from things that doesn't please Him, that can hurt us, and that He gave us His Holy Spirit who gives us that wisdom and strength and knowledge to do what He says. Praise God for that. He loves us so, so much. So, Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, and let's see what the Lord wants to teach us. It says, Paul's writing, When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction, with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. You know, that's a heavy sentence. Think about everything that Paul was going through. I mean, he was imprisoned. 
He was stoned. He was made fun of. He was beaten, etc., etc. Right? It just keeps going on. And it's interesting because I read about everything that Paul goes through, right? But he always seems so strong and so focused on the Lord that I never really think about the battles that he struggles with inside, that he has to fight against, right? The fear, the anxiety from the inside. And think about it. You can't go through all those extreme trials that Paul did without having fear. Because now you know what it's going to be like. You know what being hit by a rock feels like. You know what going into a dark, smelly dungeon, jail, feels like. You know what being whipped and what your back feels like, the blood, the oozing, the pain. And so, of course, you're going to think twice and you're going to think it's going to hurt. And that fear Satan will use to try to cripple Paul, but also to try to cripple you and me. And yet God specifically tells us in his word not to fear. So this verse that Paul writes shows that, that when we face fear, worry, anxiety, it's a battle on the inside, just like we have a battle on the outside that rages around us as we're in trials. You know? And we know when we see a battle on the outside, right? We have to put the full armor of God on that we may keep our eyes on the Lord. So how much more for the battle that Satan gives us on the inside with our feelings, do we also, even more in some ways, need to have the full armor of God on and how we have to keep our eyes on the Lord? You know, and I don't know why this never really hit me before, and I've read it numerous times, but it is a battle on the inside with our fears and all that as much as it's a battle on the outside. And I love that God warns us about that. And in verse 6, I like how Paul continues and said, But of all, God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. So Paul is struggling with all the trials he's going through, outside, you know, with everything, but then inside having to be strong in the Lord to fight those feelings of fear that God puts on him. And so God encouraged Paul and the others. And don't you love, I mean, it's just like the sweetness of God that he cares enough to encourage us just at the right time, right when he knows we need it. I mean, stop and think. Think about a really bad trial that you went through. You know, you may have been scared, worried, anxious, depressed. But the Lord, in his sweet caring, did something to encourage you. Think about that. What was it that God used to encourage you this last time? You know, it's so important to remember that the Lord allows us to go through these difficult times because he's refining us, just like gold has to be refined through the fire. It's the only way to get that gunk removed, right? And we have a lot of gunk or junk, gross stuff inside us that need to be removed. I mean, this is a fallen world. So God isn't causing the bad things to happen, but he is using it for his glory as he brings us closer to himself, as he purifies us. And he's not going to burn us. Sometimes it feels like it, but he doesn't. And then he encourages us 
right when he knows that we need it the most. And don't you love the fact that it was Titus that God used to encourage Paul? I remember, think about it, Titus was younger than Paul. Paul had been discipling him. In a sense, Titus was like Paul's student, right? Paul had been pouring into him. And so God knew that Paul needed encouragement at this time. And he didn't send some famous person, famous theologian or somebody amazing, right? Instead, God used Titus to help Paul, right? And it, it was a young student. And doesn't that encourage you that God can use you? God can use me to encourage someone that's going through a difficult time, right? You know, and don't you love that? And don't we need to be conscious of that in the sense that, Lord, help me be a blessing and encouragement to someone, right? For example, when I'm at the store or um, Mitsida, a restaurant, help me smile and say shalom to people. Even that, when somebody does that to you, isn't that an encouragement? I know it is to me. And we need to practice looking people in the eye and just smiling at them, even as we're walking by. That encourages them, gives them hope, right? And for the people that we know, how much more do we need to be an encouragement to them? You know, I know for me, even just someone texting me with a verse or saying, hey, I'm praying for you today, or I'm thinking of you today. How sweet is that, right? To know that someone's praying, to know that someone took time out of their busy schedule just to say hi and to say that they're praying for me. How sweet is that? So, the Lord uses other things to encourage us also. <clears throat> For example, the other day, um, I had to take a written test for my driver's license because I had to renew it. Now, it's probably been at least 35 years since I've had to take a written test to get my license, right? <clears throat> and... I've driven so long that I'm like, oh, how hard can this test be? But it was hard. And I took it and I flunked it. I didn't pass it. And I was devastated. And I was so nervous. I was so scared to have to take it again. Because I thought, what if I'm going to flunk it again? And I have my 93-year-old aunt that I have to care for and take places to. And so I need a driver's license, right? And where Israel is so much easier to not have a car. I love it in Israel because everything's around. Yeah, I mean, physically it's hard, but it's healthier and there's stores close by. But in California, it's not like that. There's one area, and it's zoned this way, one area for housing, and another area, usually pretty far, for the stores and things. So you really need a car. So I took the driver's handbook, and I studied it, and I went through it, and I was about to close the book and go take the test, when I felt like the Lord wanted me to look at this one sign and remember what that sign meant. So it's funny because I did it out of obedience, but it was a sign I never saw before. And I thought, I'm not going to need this for the test. I mean, who's ever even seen this sign? But you know what? I studied it and I recognized the shape of it and went and took the test. The second question was specifically about that sign. And because I had felt like the Lord impressed on my heart to study and look at this sign, then he gave me that encouragement that, hey, I'm with you. 
I will help you through this test. So I was able to relax and slowly answer the questions because I realized, hey, the Lord's with me and he was helping me. And praise God, he did and I passed and now I have my license again. <laughs> so, you know, the Lord uses so many different things and we need to be aware of that. We need to remember to thank him for that. And so, you know, I just encourage each of us this week, spend some time alone with the Lord and think and maybe even write down times that you've gone through a hard time and in different ways the Lord sent something or someone to encourage you right when you needed it or even through this scripture, through his Bible. I know he encourages us a lot that way, right? So, so Paul continues telling us why Titus was such an encouragement to him. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, and it says, His, meaning Titus, presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you, talking to the Corinthians, when he told us how much you longed to see me and how sorry you were for what happened and how loyal you are to me. I was so filled with joy. So don't you love that? So just seeing Paul, um, Titus was a, as a good friend encouraged Paul. But Paul also said the news Titus brought him was a huge encouragement. Because remember we talked about last week that Bible scholars think that there was another letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And it was between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And it was a letter written specifically talking about the sin in the Corinthian believers church congregation. And that, you know, probably it was about that man, young man that was sleeping with his stepmom and that the congregation was okay with it and not going against that, right? And remember, we found that this man repented. So God in his graciousness and mercy, you know, God figured, hey, you and I don't need to hear about it. So the letter was lost. And so Paul was probably writing this letter to them. But you know how when you do that, you have this uncomfortable feeling inside, you know, because you want people to like you. And so we continue in verse 8. It says, Paul goes, I'm not sorry that I sent this severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. But now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, lo, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you are not harmed by us in any way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but of all, worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, you know, sorry for getting caught, Paul says, results in spiritual death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you, such earnestness, such concern to clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal and such readiness, to punish the wrong. You show that you've done everything necessary to make things right. My purpose then was not to write about who did the wrong or who was wronged. I wrote to you so that in the sight of God, you could see for yourself how loyal you are to us. We've been greatly encouraged by this. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how Titus, how happy Titus was about the way you all welcomed him. 
and set his mind at ease. I had told him how proud I was of you and you didn't disappoint me. I've always told you the truth. And now my boasting to Titus has also proved true. And now he cares for you more than ever when he remembers the way all of you obeyed him and welcomed him with such fear and deep respect. I am so very happy now because I have complete confidence in you. So don't you love this? Paul is so encouraging to people, even when he's having to reprimand, to punish them, right? Paul knew that the sin that was happening in the church, and yet it would have been so much easier for Paul to have ignored it, right? Because remember the last visit Paul had, we learned from 2 Corinthians 2, 1, it didn't go very well, right? So now Paul writes this letter, sends it with Titus to the Corinthian believers, and you can imagine how Paul felt. Put yourself in his place. I mean, they were like his children. We talked last week about how Paul was the one who first told them about Yeshua. He prayed with them to give their lives to the Lord. He discipled them. So I'm sure he was thinking, oh, they're never going to talk to me again. And if you had a child who never talked to you, think about the hurt. And he wasn't just worried about his physical bond with them, but also worried about how are they going to react to the letter? And yet he cared enough about them that he was willing to tell them the truth, right? He was concerned about what they were doing. And that's extremely difficult. And each of us needs to ask the Lord for boldness and wisdom in this area. They both go hand in hand. Because sometimes we see sin in others, and the Lord just wants us to pray for them as he works on their heart. But other times he wants us to say things, you know, and we need to be careful, though it's always in the Lord's timing and not in ours. I mean, can you imagine how encouraged Paul was when Titus told him, hey, the believers read your letter, they embraced it, they repented of their sins. What a huge, huge blessing. So let's turn now to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and start with verse 1. And Paul says, totally off, off a subject now, Paul says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. So we see Paul in chapter 8 changes the subject completely. He's now going to start talking about the believers in the Macedonian churches. So Paul's talking about the congregations when he says Macedonian churches or congregations. He's talking about the congregations in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, right? And I thought to help understand the region that he's talking about, look at this map of the area. And you'll see the northern part of Greece was called Macedonia. And in that part was Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, okay, in the northern part. And the southern part, as you can see from the map, is called Acacia. And that's where the city of Corinth in the southern part of Acacia is. And so that just kind of, I know it helped me kind of see where Paul was and where he was writing, what he was talking about. So um, let's continue in 8 verse 2. And it says, talking about the congregations in Macedonia, they were being tested by many troubles. They were very poor, but they were also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. History tells us that when the Romans conquered Macedonia, they, you know, if you look in the history of it, they took most of the wealth, the money with them. The Romans did. So now they left 
the ones in Macedonia in extreme poverty. And yet Paul says that these people, the believers, were filled with abundant joy. And they're hurting. So your question, my question was, well, how can they have joy? And not just joy, but abundant joy. You know, but you've read in the Bible, both in the Tanakh, Ve Ha Ha Brit Hadashah, the Old and the New Testament, they're filled with verses on having joy in the Lord, regardless of your circumstances. For example, in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because, key, because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the believers in the Macedonian churches, in spite of severe hardship, they knew this secret. Their focus and hope was in the Lord. They had what we talked about before, that eternal vision. Knowing that their life here on earth is a short time compared to eternity in heaven with the Lord, right? So let's continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and turn to verse 3. And Paul says, For I can testify that they, the believers in Macedonian churches, gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege, privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So think about how amazing this is. Here is this region that's been conquered by Rome, they're being persecuted. The Romans had taken most of the money and, you know, livestock or anything that they could have used, right? So they were in severe poverty. Yet here they're begging Paul to let them have the privilege of donating money to the believers in Jerusalem. You know, and I would imagine Paul used the word begged because he probably told them, hey, you're in poverty. You need the money also for yourselves. Yet, a dime. They had enough faith to know that the Lord was going to take care of them. And they wanted to help those who were even in a worse situation than they were. Doesn't this so remind you of the story that Yeshua said in Luke chapter 21, 1 through 4? And it says, while Yeshua, Jesus, was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Yeshua said. This poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. I mean, think about that. And you know what? I think each of us periodically need to do, and we need to remind ourselves is to examine our own heart and ask, how am I when it comes to giving, especially if it's sacrificial giving? You know, there's so many verses in the Old and the New Testament, Tanakh, Veha, British, that talks about sacrificial giving. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, based on these verses, that we, you know, the one that we just read, for example, that God knows what we do. He sees our heart. He loves us. Oh, sweet women, he loves you so much. 
and he cares for the poor. He promises to meet our needs, right? And Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17 says, If, if you help the poor, you're lending to the Lord, and he will, not maybe, will repay you. Now, that's not why we do it. We do it to please him. But it also says he's going to take care of us. And aren't you so thankful that the Lord knows the fear in your heart that can happen when we feel him asking to sacrificially give to someone? And yet at the same time, we can never outgive the Lord. And I really encourage you this week, and I want to too, spend time alone with the Lord and read, write down the, these things that I'm going to tell you, two of them. Read 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8 through 16, okay? And 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Because they're one of my favorite stories. They're both so inspiring about giving in a hopeless situation, stepping out in faith, and seeing how the Lord meets each need. So spend time when it's quiet and you're alone with the Lord and slowly read both of these things and put yourself in these women's situations because it'll encourage you. And remember, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, And this same God who takes care of me, Paul saying this, will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Yeshua, Jesus. And then remember, Hebrews 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is the same, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And so remember that the people in the Macedonian churches, they were extremely poor, poor very poor, yet they wanted to help those that were even poorer than they were. And I think one of the reasons that the Lord asked that of us is to get our eyes off of our own situation our own poverty, and on to the Lord, right? I mean, one of the greatest ways we can help others is, of course, by praying for them. Because you're always going to find someone that's in deeper poverty than you are, right? And so ask the Lord as you're praying for them. Ask the Lord how you could help, right? And... I know one thing that years ago, and I love it, and I still try to do it, and I taught my daughters, and now as adults, they do it, um, make sack lunches of non-perishable foods, which means things that don't need to be refrigerated. You know, things like crackers, a can of tuna, cookies, a can of fruit, you know, just make sure that the cans don't need can openers. If they're the kind, you can just like flip up, right? So that they can easily be taken off. And then add a note, you know, write a note with verses or have something that's already printed that talks about how Yeshua loves them. You know, and this is just one idea. Um, and what I do is when I'm going, whether I'm walking or driving, you know, I'll just, when I see somebody poor, I will give them um, one of these sack lunches. And, you know, what a blessing. It may not be much, but it's a blessing for them. Or if I have an extra blanket that I can lovingly give to a homeless person, you know, or someone that may have an apartment, but doesn't have heat or something. So um, we would love to get more ideas 
about this so that we can help and share with each other. So if you've got ideas on how to help, add it to the chat window and just let us know about it. Because what a blessing. And like I said, there's always someone that's in a harder position than you. And especially if they don't know the Lord. Because we know that God's going to take care of us. And he always comes through. And that the fear that we have is not from him, but it's from Satan, right? And remember what Paul reminded us. <clears throat> That's this spiritual battle that we need to fight. And the Lord will help us, but we've got to be willing. We've got to put that full armor of God. We've got to be in his word. We've got to keep our eyes on him. And when those worries, those fears, those anxiety comes, we need to take our eyes off of that situation because we're no use to God when we're so bound up in fear, right? Or anger, or anything like that. Our eyes have got to be on the Lord. And what helps is to be in his word, to <clears throat> think of worship songs during this time. I love it. So we better stop here because of time. But next week we'll continue with um, what Paul says as far as helping the poor. So I hope you can join us on Friday, same time today. I am learning so much from the book of Ephesians. I love Pastor Stephen's teachings. So keep each other in prayer this week. And do chat if you have ideas as far as helping others. So God bless you. desire a greater thing to treasure I'm convinced there's nothing better than living in your love caught up in the wonder of being in your presence knowing such a friendship to be with you my God
Of your 